In this series, we're going to be looking at the letter written to the Hebrews. This is the first presentation, and we'll look at the letter in context. And the context can be seen in the, just the first few verses of the letter. The letter to the Hebrews. In our world today, and it was not that different from the first century, image is so important. This is how our societies today present things. Success seen in terms of growth, power, victory, influence, reputation. Onwards and upwards. How does Jesus fit into that kind of picture? Looked at from the point of view of history and humanity, we are following Jesus, a leader who ended up tortured to death on a Roman cross. How does that square with our pictures of success, power, victory, influence, reputation? Something that the author to the Hebrews addresses, but he addresses it in a way that brings encouragement to his hearers. It seems a remarkable picture. The encouragement comes because he is able to see Jesus on a much wider canvas, a wider totality of Jesus. He emphasizes who Jesus really is. And what you really are, that's your status. He emphasizes what Jesus really achieved. Achievement, success. He paints a picture of Jesus on a much wider canvas. Sees Jesus in a picture of totality. He was writing to people, and we don't know exactly where they were, but it's evident from the letter that these people had come from a Jewish background. They were now following Jesus. But Jesus being presented to them, painted in a much wider canvas and a bigger picture of the reality of Jesus. Here is a picture. The author pictures Jesus as the glorious Son, God himself, creator of the universe, the expression of being vested in him, showing all the glory of God in a human life. But he pictures Jesus stepping down onto our planet, being presented to us as the suffering son, executed in humiliation and public torture on a Roman cross in a backwater of the Roman Empire, the ultimate degradation of his day and age. But he's also able to see Jesus as he is now, the triumphant son, crowned with glory and honour for what he achieved, the heir of all things, he owns all things, he made all things. He's not just an angel, he's not a superman, he's God himself. The writer to the Hebrews writing to people who are looking at things from a Jewish perspective, is able to see Jesus in a much wider and larger way. Let's go back to that picture. Who he is, what he has done. 
and he presents Jesus to his readers, his hearers, central in God's plan for the universe. Now that's mind-blowing. He presents Jesus as a fulfillment of all that the Old Testament describes. Now the Jewish people and people who were attached loosely to Jewish synagogues would be steeped in the Old Testament. He's presenting Jesus fulfilling all of that, completing it all. But these early followers of Jesus were living in a world where it was tough to be a follower of Jesus. Everything was against them all around. Some were trying to drag them back into the Jewish system, the religious system of the day. Others were trying to drag them into other pagan religions with all their temples and religious systems. While the Roman authorities were trying to pressurize them to conform to kind of emperor worship. Perseverance was the order of the day, just to survive. There's great encouragement here for his early hearers. It's probably written before the fall of Jerusalem because the writer assumes that the temple rituals were still going on. And the whole temple system was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Now we know that the letter has to be first century in authorship because it is quoted within the first century, towards the end. But it's probably before that date. We don't know exactly who the groups were, but either they were people who'd been who'd moved from Judaism into followers being followers of Jesus, or there were people that were known loosely at that time as God feeders, people of the societies who were loosely attached on the fringe of synagogues around the Roman Empire. Who the author is we don't know. Doesn't identify himself. Written to people with a Jewish background, they would know something of the Old Testament. And the writer shows a real grasp of the Old Testament and he shows that he comes himself from a Jewish background. Yes, he has a good grasp of the Greek language, the language of the day. And he quotes the Old Testament a large number of times. But in the way he uses Greek, there are signs that Hebrew was possibly his first language. There are many words that are unique, that are not used elsewhere in the New Testament. It is certainly not written by Paul. The language is totally different, the thought forms are different. It's, yes, consistent with Paul's theology, but it's completely different in its approach. And that was established and agreed from its earliest days. It offers new insights, but the insights fit neatly into the insights that come from other books of the New Testament. It brings in a fresh dimension of thinking. It's looking at things from a Jewish perspective. And there's so much that can be helpful to us today. A great theologian put it that way. The book demonstrates that Christ stands in continuity with the Jewish system by fulfilling it, brings it all to completion, makes it redundant. Very important to insight and that would be important for the early hearers of this book read to them. There's a kind of journey through the book. The first section speaks about God's final revelation of himself in Jesus. God has spoken to people in the past, yes. Now God was entering humanity in the life of Jesus. God's final revelation. But it's meaningless for humanity unless we respond to it. 
That's stressed very greatly. Central part pictures Jesus as a great high priest. Now that's drawing from the Jewish tradition and ideas. Because that shows what God has achieved for us. And we'll develop that further as we go through the book. But continuously there's a call for response. To follow Jesus then was tough. The pressures from within society to conform to the social norms of the day were enormous. There was pressures from the religious side but there was also pressure from the political side, from the authorities of the Roman Empire, who wanted to use religion to prop up the Roman Empire and saw the way of Jesus as a threat. These were tough days. In this journey, we could look at the first part as God speaks. God shows himself. God acts. He deals with a fundamental problem that faces humanity then and today. But it's only meaningful for humanity if we respond to what God is saying and to what God is doing. There's a kind of logical progression through the book. It's a journey. The author is stressing that God has done it all for us in Jesus. We humans are not capable of solving our fundamental problems. We think we can run our lives our own way and we know what's best. And looking back at the history of humanity, it shows what a mess we make of it. We rebel against the Maker's instructions. Jesus dealt with that. We're not capable of sorting ourselves out. But if we don't respond to what God has done in Jesus, it's all meaningless. We'll just continue on running our own lives our own way and making a mess of it. But the opposition to change is considerable. So there's a great encouragement in the book. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going, this is the best way. And to enable us to keep going, Jesus provides all we need. Not all we want, but all we need. To live quality lives and to bring benefit to those around us. There is the journey of the book written to the Hebrews. Now that back cloth in mind, let's look at the first four verses that capture the essential essence and thrust of the whole book. The book relentlessly focuses on Jesus. Not us, not our thinking, not our theology, not our cleverness, not our religious systems, focuses on Jesus. God's self-disclosure in his Son. God shows us all that he is and is doing and he does it in a human life. Here's the text of the first four verses. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, that's Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he, Jesus, had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
so he became as much superior to the angels as to the name, as the name he's inherited is superior to theirs. It's a majestic opening, split into sentences in the English, but just flowing as one sentence in the original language. Let's focus on the first little bit. There's a play with words here. The words sound very much the same. At many times, it's one word in various ways. Is one word. God communicates to human beings in multiple ways. He knows the ways that we as individuals and communities can understand things best. God spoke to prophets. If you like, they were mouthpieces showing the mind of God in a situation. God speaks to us in many ways. That's what's happened down through the ages. In the original, it's in a son. Reads better as by his son in English. But you can see there's a great depth of meaning here. God speaks to human beings, not just through what Jesus said. He speaks to human beings in Jesus. In the very nature of the way Jesus worked, how he behaved, what he said, how he treated other people, in his very nature, in his activities, in what he did. God speaks to us through a life, a life that was lived in the first century in the land of Israel. Too easy to just to reduce it to the messages, the words that Jesus said. It's the very presence of Jesus, his very existence, his very lifestyle carries a message of God's revelation to human beings. You see, the author seeing things in a much bigger and wider way. That's his great contribution to our thought forms today. In the original, it says he made the ages. In those days, people thought of the ages. We're living in the age when things aren't very good. There'll come an age when God puts it right. That's the way they thought. Not in time terms, but in quality of life terms. He made the universe captures the meaning quite well, but it's even bigger than that. Yes, Jesus made the universe. But it's more than just a physical universe. It's why it exists, the nature of existence and its destiny. It's all centered in Jesus. Again, the author has pictured Jesus so much bigger. Paints the picture of Jesus on a wider canvas. Everything is centered in Jesus. Everything in this universe, everything in this world, finds its meaning in Jesus. It's an expression of the life of God himself in Jesus. Let's add on the next sentence. Radiance of God's glory. That captures the idea of a kind of outshining, coming out of the life of Jesus. His very nature, his existence, his very being, his activities, his lifestyle, outshines, shows us, reveals us all the very nature of God himself. Now the word that's translated exact representation here is a word that was used of the imprint on a Roman coin of the emperor's head. An exact representation. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. Look at his lifestyle. Look at his behavior. Look at how he treated others. Look at what he said. Look at what he did. An exact representation of the very nature and being of God himself. These are powerful pictures. Again, he's picturing Jesus in a very big way. All that Jesus is shows God in all his fullness. 
Now that's worth pondering, it's mind-blowing. It's not just the teaching of Jesus, it's all that he is. Shows God in all his fullness. If you like, God entered our world in the life of Jesus. He limited himself by choice within a human body of a human being. Born into an ordinary artisan home in a backwater of the Roman Empire, with younger brothers and sisters and parents, God entered our world in the life of a real human being. And in Jesus we can see all that God is. That has to be God's ultimate communication. There can be nothing bigger than that. The last little phrase there literally is sustaining all things by the spoken word of the power of him. The word that's translated word always refers to that which is spoken. Jesus spoke and things happened. They showed the power of God. Jesus again is painted in this bigger picture. When he speaks, he controls the destiny, the nature of the whole universe. That's a big picture. It reflects his total authority. Not just then, but for all time. Jesus is the Lord of glory who stepped down and limited himself within a human being. Adding on the last couple of sentences to this section let's just fade it out to give us a bit more room. Can't tell from the English but that in the original language the tense used speaks about something which is specific for a purpose. not a general statement provided purification for sins that centers on what Jesus achieved in his death on the cross later we'll look at the picture of the great high priest a high priest offered sacrifices Jesus is a great high priest because he offered the ultimate sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice was himself and the author develops that and throws and shows wonderful insights that can help us to understand what Jesus has achieved. And the idea of sitting down at the right hand of God, that's just a picture, a metaphor, showing that the task he came to achieve has been done, it's been completed. As he died on the cross, his last words were one word in the language of the day finished completed it wasn't a word of resignation a word saying my life's gone it was a word of victory that's the meaning of the word in the original he had achieved totally what he came to do you see we're back to reputation and status again Jesus is fully God he's not another angelic being that God has sent as a messenger the word in the original language for angel is the same word that we could use for messenger. He's not a great prophet, despite what our Muslim friends may say today. Jesus is God who entered the human arena. He's fully God. God's final communication to humanity. You see, this is the central problem, and it was then, and it is today. People try to reduce Jesus. He was a good man, the founder of a religion, a great prophet, a great teacher. No, we've got it wrong. And the author here sees vividly he got it wrong, and he shows how from the Old Testament the picture that so often we paint is wrong. Jesus is fully God. God entered our, the human arena in the life of a human being. 
And we, when we reduce that picture, we lose out. We misunderstand. And we can't grasp what he's done and achieved. Back to that whole text there, the whole section. It's worth just reading it again and again and just reflecting on it because it reflects the central theme of the letter. He sees Jesus and he paints the understanding of the picture of Jesus on a much wider canvas. He has got a grasp of the wonderful nature of Jesus. It's not inconsistent with what Paul wrote, not inconsistent with what John wrote in his letters. But it's a wonderful picture that gives us a great insight into the real Jesus. What he had, who he is and what he did. We could summarize it that way. This is the greatest and most complete and final self-disclosure of God himself. Who God is seen in a way that we human beings can understand it in the life of a human being. And the author here is showing it's the climax and the fulfillment of all previous revelation because he's tying it back rigorously to the pictures that come from the Old Testament because he's writing it, writing it to an audience who understood something of what the Old Testament said. That was their background. Bringing it together, the climax of God's self-revelation. That's mind-blowing. The God who made the universe entered our world, which is but a speck in the universe. And he entered the world, not with mind-blowing power, because we could never have understood it, but he chose to limit himself within the flesh and blood of a human being from an ordinary background, just like us. We can make sense of that. God shows himself. And the writer pictures it as the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. When we look at Jesus, we can see what God is, what he does, and what his purposes are. But it's all consistent with the revelations that have come previously through prophets or angels. But it's much greater, much more complete. There was a lot of richness and diversity of things that have happened in the past as God has shown himself through people. But this gives the complete picture. Everything's brought together. That's the central thrust of this letter. God speaks to humanity through Jesus. And if that's true, it is absolutely imperative that we listen and respond. Because it's the God who made the universe. We can see it all in his life and teaching. We must look at it and respond to it. But the writer also speaks and pictures what God has done for humanity through Jesus. Jesus came to deal with the basic central problem of human beings that we want to run our lives our own way and we don't know what's best so we make a mess of it but even worse our way often runs in contradiction to the way others want to run their lives so we end up with strife and conflict and our world is full of it today and it all stems back to that fundamental reason we think we know best and we're not able to solve that problem as history shows Jesus can solve that problem the word sins there is a word that means missing the mark we set off in life like an arrow fired at the target we miss the bullseye, but the way we're going, we're going to miss the target completely. 
Jesus deals with that fundamental problem that we human beings have. He made us. He made our universe. He knows the best way. A way of purpose and harmony. But the author doesn't stop there. He shows how Jesus, now having achieved all that, hath resumed his rightful place in heaven as God Almighty. That's the picture of Jesus painted on a much bigger canvas. That's the background to this letter to the Hebrews. In the next part, the author goes on to look at the superiority of Jesus over both angels and Moses. Moses.